on Thanks. this computer. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So I see you're already recording. Perfect. Okay. All right. So I had to step outside the building in order to uh, listen to the business portion of the meeting. So it's a beautiful night out. All right, Don, you ready for me to go? Uh, you are being recorded. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Todd Clark. I'm the vice president for the Tallahassee Amateur Radio Society. And this evening's program, uh, we are fortunate to have uh, Paul Eugenio, who is KN4TRT, and he's going to be talking tonight about um, JT8. So those of you who are familiar with uh, FT8, uh, which is a, uh, uh, a digital mode that allows you to communicate using uh, the radio and a computer, um, but the, 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 the limitation there was you really couldn't do much in terms of uh, of chatting or, or having a message, uh, you had a very short time period and basically you could exchange a signal report and, uh, and a grid location. Uh, so Paul's going to tell us about uh, a, uh, a modification that is uh, instead of FT8, it's JT8 uh, that does allow some actual uh, uh, back and forth and, and, and uh, short communications. So with that, I will turn it over to Paul and uh, looking forward to hearing about this. Okay, well, let me start off first with one correction. Um, and the, the mode is not JT8, it's JS8. And I think part of the confusion came because the initial version of the program was called FT8 Call. Uh, and then they made it its own mode. Uh, and so uh, JS8. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and when, you know, when putting together this talk, um, I, you know, I, I'm a, a big fan of, of JS8 call, um, but I want to preface this that, um, you know, this is an overview from, from a relatively new ham. Um, it was, you know, I look back and it was a little over a year ago that I first took my tech exam and then took the general. Um, and I had my license for Oh, about seven months, and I didn't even own a radio. And it wasn't until you know last uh, December that I couldn't. You know, I'd been looking at all these radios to buy, but you know, with the holiday deals, I ended up buying uh, a radio. And so I've been basically, uh, you know, making good use of my radio since about January of this year. So there are a lot of you know, well, ex you know, uh, experienced. Uh, members here, and I've been benefiting from from uh, you know from getting knowledge from them. But I just wanted to preface that I may you know some of my opinions are coming more from uh, uh, you know a new hams perspective. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that started. I wanted to start off with a poll, and I realized uh, during our first business meeting that that um, you know we probably could have had the vote uh, done through Zoom poll. So I'm going to ask a question. I'm launching a poll right now. Everyone should get a poll popped up. That's just a, a simple question asking, how long have you been, you know, have you had your amateur radio license? And so, <clears throat> you know, less than two years, two to 10 years, 10 to 20, over 20. Okay, we almost got all just missing one more. I'll give uh, another few seconds for getting the last person's vote. Okay. Oh, I'll just end it now. Okay, so out of the 12 people that voted, uh, I'm believing I'm sharing the results. Um, Todd, just nod if you see that on the screen. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to sort of get an idea of, uh, you know, who we're talking to. So I'm glad to see that there's a good spread uh, of, uh, <clears throat> you know, of experience, I should say. In there. Okay. So let me get back to JSA call. I wanted to, to sort of first talk about my plans for this presentation, because I think there's, there's a lot of information online uh, several tutorials for setting up JS8 call, where to get the program. 
Um, there's a cornucopia of information on setting up for and running FT8. So how to set up WSJTX and which has very similar settings. You look at the programs, actually there's a lot of uh, the uh, open sourceness of the code really extends on top of uh, what was utilized in WJT, uh, WSJTX. So rather than having a tutorial by saying, okay, here's how you connect this and that, I wanted to, to spend time just going over some of the features and the operational details that, that I really didn't appreciate when I first started using this. And I've, and I've really learned to appreciate more. Um, and then at the end of that, I hopefully will just give a quick live run of uh, JS8 call. Uh, that assumes the, the network is working uh, because I'm actually in my office at FSU uh, and my radio is sitting on a kitchen table uh, about 11 miles away at home. So. <clears throat> okay, so the JS8 digital mode uh, and the program JS8 call. Uh, so JS after the creator, Jordan Shear. Uh, Shear. Um, so I sort of have the quote here of the, you know, the idea of uh, JS8 call was sort of take this robustness of FT8 and add on to it layers of messaging and the network protocols for weak uh, signal communications. Uh, so um, <clears throat> along, so it takes the FT8 and extends it at the very least with more of a keyboard to keyboard interface. Um, and it's well noted in, in the documentation by Jordan, uh, acknowledging that uh, the inspiration and a lot of the, you know, the heavy work was, uh, you know, done by people before him. Uh, so you'll see that there's a heavily influenced by uh, WSJTX, FL Digi, and FSQ Call, which I have to admit, uh, I was not familiar with. Uh, so he gives a good shout out to uh, the whole community on, on, you know, how he built up the JS8 call and the JS8 mode from, from uh, those efforts. Uh, so another quote, standing on the shoulders of giants. So I show here the JS8 call program, uh, application program in the top left. Uh, the lower right is the WSJTX. And so you just look at them and you can sort of see a lot of similarities there. Uh, you know, the, the little receive uh, indicator and sort of the band activities and frequencies. And, but you look a little closer and you also see that it has buttons that are actually configurable very much like FL Digi for uh, operating uh, PKS or other modes like Olivia. One of the nice things JS8 call runs, right? It runs on practically all computers, most computers. I think any computer system now will, uh, uh, you know, will, uh, you know, will compile, you run this in an open source fashion, you can build the applications for almost anyone. And it's provided for Windows, for Mac, for uh, Raspberry Pis running Raspbian, or even uh, desktop Linux and so forth. Uh, the program is freely available. Uh, it has its own website, uh, you know, uh, basically js8call.com. So you can get the, uh, not only the program from there, but there's also documentation and uh, other useful information there. Setting up and configuring JS8 call, as I said, is almost identical to setting up and configuring WSJTX. Uh, it's, I swear, it's got to be the exact same code because you open up the configuration file. And if you've done it for WSJTX, you, know, you don't even have to know what to do in, in JS8 call. It's uh, nearly identical. So um, the one ad advantage uh, with JS8 call, and maybe this is true now for WSJTX, is that um, JS8 call has this automatic time synchronization. So you don't have to worry about you know, setting up to a clock and making sure that your clock is, is accurate. The program will actually look at the start and stops of transmission frames and will just adjust uh, your, your offsets uh, relative to that. So that's a nice feature. You don't have to worry about 
you know, going to time.is and, and just uh, making sure everything's all set there. Oh. <clears throat> so when I was preparing and just thinking about what I was going to talk about, um, I, I wanted to just, you know, so I started doing some testing uh, of some of the ideas uh, on, you know, on my, on my, uh, my radio and, and uh, just sort of show some of the JS8 activity. This is a relatively no, new program, just, a, just been out for what, maybe a year and a half or so. Um, <clears throat> and you can get an idea of that activity by just looking at PSK Reporter. Um, in the top left, you can sort of see the, the modes that uh, the popular modes over the last two hours. So it's just the last two hours. But what I will say is that every time I do look at this, that you know, JS8 is consistently in the top four of this listing. So it gives you an idea that this, this is actually being utilized by more peoples. Um, and, and I do see this quite growing quite rapidly. Below was after I started testing this, I came back the next morning and I just wanted to just sort of get an idea of some of the reports of my own signals using JS8 call. Uh, so I went to PSK reporter, plugged in my call sign, just looked for the last 24 hours. And this was even on you know, a couple, probably a week and a half or so ago um, when the band conditions weren't even at the conditions they are now. So I think after Jerry's discussion, I'd be eager to see how good the propagation is for particularly here, this is a 40 meters for JSA. Okay. So here's the program. And so I'm going to go around and sort of show uh, some of the main features. You have the VFO band control on the top left. You can control the rig, you know, change your frequency here. You can uh, go up or down, or you could just click on it and it will pop up and allow you to select preset band, band, band passes for the, for the different bands. So often I I'll click on it and go to the 80 meter or the 40 meter and it will have the sort of the standard agreed presets frequencies for JS8 call. Generally, they are just a few kilohertz just above the FT8 uh, you know, selected frequencies. Um, I think you may recall for 40 meters, uh, FT8 is uh, 7.074 uh, megahertz. Um, but if you go across the top, you have a little information about your station. Um, you have uh, some buttons at the top, uh, one for enable reporting. I'll go in greater detail. Uh, but these are control buttons. Uh, you can enable and disable the transmission or receiving capabilities. Uh, you can set the different JS8 modes. Uh, the different modes are related to basically the speeds, I like to think of them. Um, as opposed to FT8 or FT4, they were just, in JS8, they're just different speeds. Um, you have your nice little handy tune button, often plug, you know, check how, how things are going, and there's a built-in log. Uh, the main windows below, you have the band activity window on the lower left, well, the middle left, and directly in the center, this is called your directed activity. This is the activity that you see that you're either selected for or, or that uh, I'll talk about how it's either directed to you. Um, there's the outgoing, you know, this is where you type here box for sending, for composing your outgoing messages. Um, there is this call station activity uh, window, which which lists the call stations that you hear, plus it provides other useful information. And I'll go into detail why this is quite uh, handy. Um, but you'll see that there are also these macro buttons that are user defined, your CQ message, uh, your, uh, how to reply to someone's CQ, uh, sending off signal reports or info about your station. You can configure these uh, quite easily. Uh, in addition, there's a heartbeat button and I'll go a lot more into details of, of the heartbeat. But below that, you'll see that there's the very familiar RX audio level. Uh, the first thing you learn is you want to sort of keep it in the middle and green, and you're good to go. Um, 
You have the band pass waterfall uh, to the right of that. And you can see in red with the two indicators is the default frequency offset. So it sort of shows your band uh, width that you for your specific mode. But also note, there's no distinction between transmission and receive. You basically find a spot in the band pass that you want to transmit from and, and just choose that. So generally, you'll choose a space that is, that's just not occupied and not have to worry about uh, uh, receiving versus transmission. Um, there are a couple buttons about the directed status and deselection. Uh, I'll go into more. Um, there's also a control for the audio level uh, on the right, you'll see the little green slider. Um, I use this, uh, I keep my radio set at a certain power settings that I'm usually using for, uh, you know, for voice operations. And then I just control this to lower the power output that's being transmitted by just reducing the audio level. And I try to run it between 30 and, 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 and 40 watts output power. Uh, and then you can also, type things, you can either hit enter to send or hit a button to send, you can halt transmissions and, and so forth. So this is sort of the general overview of, of the, uh, the program, uh, running the program. Um, though to really get a good appreciation, I think it's important to spend a little time talking about how it's transmitting. And so the mode, like FT8, well, JS8 modes, all the modes send data in packets of 72 bits. So this is your trans, what they call a transmission time frame. And during that time frame, it's sending 72 bits. And, and so the program itself determines the best way to package your message. And it does through by different means. One is what's called a Hoffman type compression, right? And the idea with Hoffman compression, it says, is to use less bits more often. So you look at the, the coding for characters and it weights uh, characters that are, you're most, most likely to use more, it will actually use less bits. So you can see the letter E takes three bits to send. The letter V though takes seven bits to send. So it will pack things that way. So it's a nice smart way of of maximizing this. But even more, I think a, a more important feature, and one you'll note that the letter E is the only letter that has three bits. So there's other things you can send with just three bits that are not just characters. And this comes in to the second way in which JS8 you know, packs its, its transmission packages. And this is through dictionary compression. So the idea with the dictionary compression is send a word index. Your program has a copy of a dictionary. And then you just say, use this word at this index number. So you're sending just the information about the word index and not the characters of the word. All right, so here I show below uh, some of uh, that I pulled out. This is from the code J, JSC underscore map dot CPP. So it gives you an indication the program's written in C++. And so this is some of the words that are in the dictionary. Um, but one you can see is like, for example, channel, right? So it's the, the word, then it's the size, and then this index number. So channel just takes you know, seven bits. If you look over here, the letter C takes six bits to, for tra of transmission space. So really you benefit by utilizing the dictionary. And, and at first I didn't realize this and I would be sending in things and using what I've been learning, some of the older ham techniques of, of trying to truncate words where some people may know well or others don't, or you're looking up. But you can see that by transmitting full words, communications, right? That only takes 14 bits. That's the equivalent of sending two letter Vs. Um, and what's really nice about it is the program itself has a spell checker or, okay, equivalently a, a dictionary word recognizer. And so actually here's a clip from my JS8 call where you can see I typed in uh, cheeker and checker. 
And if it doesn't recognize the, the word as a dictionary word, it gives you the sort of the spell checker indicating the red wavy line. That is tremendously useful. One, because I'm a terrible speller and or, I, or I'll make simple mistakes, but not just in you know getting the word correct, but it's it will really allow you to send your transmissions much cleaner and much shorter and with less opportunities of of losing uh, information that you that you send out. So it's as I mentioned, it's so these programs are sending transmissions in frames. So 72 bits being sent. And with JS8, there's you don't have the odd even synchronization that you have with FT8. It's just you just have the, the frame. So if you send the message, you don't have to worry about being your message being contained within 72 bits. You write a message and it will break it up and it will send. Uh, multiple your message as multiple transmission frames. Um, what it does at the end, uh, it provides a special character, the a la character. Automatically, when you type in a message and when it transmits, the end of your message is indicated by this sort of that diamond a la character that's automatically placed there, which sort of lets everyone know that, okay, this transmission is done. It may have taken several frames, but it's it's now I got a complete message. Uh, the other thing that's important to note is that you're not restricted to some of the, the simple uh, character restrictions. So you have the extended character set. Uh, it does limit you to uppercase letters, but you also have a lot of other special characters and you can even utilize some of the Latin one extensions. So. Okay, so in addition, to the macros, right? You have these uh, messages that you can predefine or configure for your message buttons for transmitting calming messages. Uh, you can edit these quite easily from the settings window. Uh, you can also go beyond that and create a list of saved messages, which have uh, macro like functionality. So, not just the buttons, but you can click where you want to type and it pull up a message and then just what something that you saved before, you know, a preamble to the starting of a net or something, multiple lines and just, and that uh, you can you just have that saved message be uh, inserted into to your tra transmission stream. Also, there are macro variables, very similar to variables I've seen, you know, in FL Digi, you have uh, the my call, my grid four, or my grid 12, uh, my info for your station info. So these can all be predefined and then you can utilize these uh, inside your, your messages. Quite nice when you're reporting to somebody, you know, their call or their signal report, you don't have to go look and copy it down. You can just include SNR and whoever you're replying to, it will re reply and uh, provide that info. So these macros, right, in the macro, uh, I should say variables, you can also utilize in your configured messages like your CQ, reply, and info. Okay, so, so here are the transmission modes, or refer to speeds, right? These, <clears throat> and you have the opportunity to choose a slow, a normal, a fast, or a turbo mode. And you can adjust these real time. You can be communicating with someone to start off normally and, and find out that you, you're receiving them clearly, they're receiving you real clear and you could decide to speed things up and jump up in speed. So the difference in these to go from slow to fast is the faster the frames are, the, well, the, lot, the wider the bandwidth. The normal bandwidth, the 15 second frames, um, and then you can go to the fast mode, the 10 second frame, that's sort of like going from FT8, I believe to FT4. Um, and so as the bandwidth increases, you can see you're gonna, you can get uh, the, the words per minutes typically will increase. And, but the smaller the bit sub bandwidth, the, the uh, I should say the lower, the, or the smaller the signal or the lower the signal, in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 your receive uh, DB, uh, you know, um, 
So this, so the smaller, or the slower you go, the narrower the band. Basically, the the the, the poorer signal you can uh, uh, decode down to, and so you can sort of see how the decoding, you know, starts as you start moving up from slow to turbo. How you are not able to decode signals as cleanly as you are at the slower speeds. So you can, by looking at other people's signal reports and how you are reported to them, can decide, hey, let's jump up to turbo. And, and turbo is quite, you know, when you jump up to turbo after using normal for a while, it's, it's almost, it's like that, uh, you know, PSK 31 type speed and activity. You're typing and you, your transmitting is catching up faster than you, than you can type. Um, so it's actually quite exciting, I, I think. Now inside these frame sec, because it's sending these uh, messages in these 72 bit time frames, uh, you can look at the duty cycle for multiple frame transmissions, right? And because there's dead air between transmissions, um, right? Which means, for example, in normal mode, you're not transmitting for the full 15 seconds of the frame. It's transmitting for 84% uh, of that. So uh, 12.6 seconds per 15 seconds. And, and that's, that's the same rate for going the slow mode. But you can see as you go up into the faster modes, up to turbo mode, which is transmitting your the 72 bits in 3.95 seconds in a transmission frame of six seconds. So that only gives you a duty cycle of, of 65%. So if you're also worried about Having high transmission rates, you can you know you can look at your transmission, you know the the duty cycles here, and you can adjust uh, if if your conditions allow for that. You can type ahead, as I already mentioned, while you're transmitting. There's a type ahead feature, um, um, and uh, as you uh, type your message, though, and one of the nice features is as you're typing a message, even before you hit send. Um, the send button itself will start telling you the time it will take for your message, right? By default, the first thing you got, if you're in normal mode, okay, you start typing, it's 15 seconds. But then if you go into another frame, then it will jump up to 30 seconds. And you can look at things and see, oh, well, how about if I change, you know, using this word and finding out that uh, by, by, you know, utilizing full dictionary words, you can actually... Uh, reduce the transmission quite substantially, uh, the transmission time. Okay, so decoding packets. So this is actually the menu that pops up on JSA call. So you can see that you can select these transmission modes, the slow, normal, fast, turbo. Um, and you, as I already mentioned, you can do this in right in the middle of, of a QSO. Uh, you can you can even have mixed modes. Somebody is is operating in slow, and you're operating in fast. Um, the the program has the ability, and by default, you uh, enable the simultaneous decoding of all speeds. So you'll see these speeds going. Somebody's running turbo, but you're you have normal mode select. You're able to see those messages. So it's independent of that. It's like it's like having these you know multiple. Well, it is. It's more having them all at, at, at one. It just, you can turn that off if you wish. Um, it's a feature to have, but uh, I, I, I really see no reason not to have the multi uh, you know, decoding uh, option on. Um, there is this frame here, there's this uh, additional menu uh, for decoder sensitivity. And this is indicates how you want JS8 call to sort of decode through your message. You can go through one pass, two pass, three pass, four passes. The first pass just sort of does a quick, you know, scanning through and recognizing. Uh, if it does a multiple pass, well, anything it recognizes the first time, it removes. And then it will go through the second pass and look for the remaining signals that's in there. Um, in addition, the additional uh, statistical methods are used, certain trying to guess maybe, or trying to use multiple, which requires more CPU cycles to, uh, as you go higher in decode. But I'll be honest, 
Um, I've been using the four, you know, uh, decode passes on a Raspberry Pi. And I see, you know, I have right on my screen, the CPU activity. I'm using one of the newer, the Raspberry Pi 4Bs, but I really, you know, never stressing that CPU. It's, you know, I'm lucky to see if it goes up to half utilization. So I really think while this is great for maybe older systems, but nowadays um, you could probably run the four, four, you know, three to four passes. Um, one statement that is, has been mentioned by the developers, and I haven't, I don't know if I have verified this or not, or, um, but the claim is that it can normally decode two completely overlapping signals with three or more decode passes. So you can have two people right on top of each other and it will pull out one and as it's pulling out, recognize it. So it will be, it has the ability to completely uh, decode those two. And you'll see them coming up as, as two separate messages. I, I, I find that quite, quite amazing. Um, so the, as I said, the multiple decoder can decode all four speeds at once. Um, and for some messages, you have the ability to do forward error correction, right? So it does this parity check. Uh, it uses some of the bits in the, in the, of the 72 in the transmission frame for parity error correction. Uh, similar to these, uh, you know, Hamming codes for people who are remember, uh, familiar with that. So it uses some information to find one or two additional errors and can correct that. That's a nice, nice feature. Okay, so messaging. Messages, comes in, they, messages come in three main formats. You have undirected messages, you have directed messages, and you have storage and retrieval messages. So undirected messages, this is sort of like uh, and I have a note here, this is sort of like PSK31 operation on FL Digi, right? It's a free forming um, and you, you, have a, you have your frequency, your receive band that you've chosen. And if other stations align their receiver offset to within what, 10 Hertz of your transmission offset, then they'll be able to receive your messages. Um, and this is something that's not by default, but it's something that you could do. You One of the configurations, here's the configuration, you check marks it and it allows sending messages without a call sign. So here's the example right here, right? Uh, KK4, SIH, DE, KN4, TRT. It has been a busy week at work, but I got to enjoy the weather this weekend, catching up on outdoor projects and walking the dog. Wish everyone a good week ahead. Uh, BTU, DE, KN4, TRT, K. This is actually one of our messages that we send out. That was one I sent out on one of the Sunday night North Florida digital nets. Uh, so that's how uh, you could send the exact same thing and just JS8, sort of a la you know, PSK uh, modes. Okay, directed messages. This is where I spend most of my time. I, 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 honestly, I never use undirected messages. The advantages of directed messages, one, it will automatically insert your call sign. Um, the advantage of that is that when you're communicating with people and your call signs attached to it, when they reply to and include your call sign, their message can be anywhere in the passband. You don't have to select it. If it's somewhere and it has, and it's directed to you, then it will appear as if it's inside your same receiver. So messages that are, that are within your selected receiver range or that have your call sign will come to you. That's quite nice. So uh, along, okay, so as I said, as long as you're in the same passband, you don't have to worry about uh, any frequency offset. So to send directed messages, right? So you either start off by including the call sign first to somebody, um, as I, shown in this example be be below. So I type KK4SIH and then I include my message right after it. Um, and then when I hit enter, that gets transmitted as shown above. Um, or um, one of the other nice features is you'll be able to select the station and make it active. And, and you don't even have to, once it's active, you don't even have to add their their call sign, you can just type your message to them and it will, you go back and forth having 
having your uh, QSO. Okay, so uh, call groups. So call groups, right? This is sort of like multicast messaging. What, um, so you can create groups. Uh, everyone is a member of what's called the all call, at all call. So when you send a, a CQ request, uh, it actually goes out to the group all call and everyone will get that, a message that you're calling CQ. Uh, you can see I created some other ones and, and you do this by, um, you can either do it right live in the program or in your configuration, you get a little text box and you just enter in uh, these call groups. And you can see, I just made these up uh, at NFL Digi, at TARS. So now I'm a member of this group. And if you go to your configuration and you just say, okay, I wanna be a member of at TARS, well, then you will receive all of this, th these messages that go to that call group. So here's an example uh, where I sent a message, not to a user, but to the call group at TARS. So at TARS from KN4TRT, just sent out a message, TARS October meeting presentation, you know, steps to successfully uh, QSLing uh, by Jerry. Um, so in that message, whoever is active on the band running JS8 call and is a member of the TARS uh, call group would receive that message. And you'll see this window, the call activity window. So it not only includes the call groups that you're part of, but it, it, it lists the stations, the call signs that you hear. So you can see these are the stations that you hear and provides the, uh, how well you're hearing them, this, their signal and, and other additional information where they're offset and, and even the grid information and can automatically do distancing for you. There's additional information here. Um, you'll see some of them have a star. And if there's a star next to it, it just indicates that not only do you hear that station, but that station hears you. Right? That's quite useful to know that not only do you hear them, but they hear you. Um, if there's a little phone next to a station, well, they've called CQ. And you could find out, well, how long ago did they call CQ? It could have scrolled on past the, you know, the, the banned messages, but you could get an idea of who's calling CQ. And there's also this flag indicator, which indicates that someone has left you a message. So I'll talk more about messages uh, shortly, but, but this, right, utilizing this call activity, right, this helps you quickly find, uh, you know, other operators, right, that you're, you know, that are looking to make contact, uh, that you can contact, or, other operators that can aid in making a contact via a relay. So what's a relay message? Okay, so uh, you can, well, it's a directed message that's sent to a station through a station relay. So the, here's sort of the structure of it. You have relay station, and then you redirect to a destination station, and you have a message. You know, and you're basically asking the relay station to please, you know, pass this message along. The nice thing about message when you do it automatically adds a checksum for the forward error correction. So here's an example below, right? I, I have a message. I'm right. Uh, so I'm asking Don to to relay this message to Todd. Uh, I chose Todd because sometimes when I'm in Fort Walton Beach on Sunday nights. I don't hear his signal clearly, and I, but I only get an indication through Don. So here's a, here's a way I could send a message to Todd that if I didn't hear him clearly uh, through relaying through, uh, through Don. So hi, Todd, I would be happy to give an overview of JS8 call at the next club meeting. All right, so that sort of gives you that example of, uh, of, of relaying. Uh, and um, you'll notice that, the, in the white space, that's the message that I typed, but the red is what I transmitted. So you can see, if you look right at the end, there are, there's characters CTO, and then you have the ALA, meaning end of transmission. That CTO is automatically added, and that's part of the checksums for doing the error correction. Then you can see that 
KK4SIH redirected or this message to KN4FCC and indicates that it's a relay message with the message, but added to it DE KN4TRT. So now it, this is an indication to Todd that this was a relay message from me through, through Don. And you can see that right at the end, there's this da, uh, minus P period. Well, that's the checksum, All right? So relays are not, this is not a repeater. You're not just taking a message and repeating it out. It's actually, it's relaying. It's taking the message in and it's transmitting a completely new message out. Um, optionally, right, this message right, can be relayed to its final destination to multiple relay stations by just prefixing additional call signs to the message. So I don't know why, but maybe I wanna ask, you know, ask Don to relay a message to Tom, who would relay a message to Chief, who would relay the message to Todd. And then there's the message. Um, and there's actually some award if you can relay to so many continents and back. Um, so there are people looking at that. And I, I often wondered if, if there, wouldn't it be interesting to send, you know, someone in Tallahassee a message, but relaying it to, you know, to Canada that relays it to, to Russia, that relays it to India, that relays it to uh, Australia, that relays it to Argentina, that relays it to Brazil, which relays it to the Keys, which relays it to Tallahassee. So you could do the big loop that way. Um, so, or uh, if you're out and uh, I know that there are people who are using this on mobile operations out in the parks or QRPing. Uh, you may have, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, something, a big mountain in front of you or, and it might be better to just go around different ways. So you can have, it builds in this flexibility. Okay. So another uh, key feature is message storage and retrieval. So you have your station on, you're running and you just, you know, somebody calls you on the phone or you get up, go to the bathroom and you decide to have lunch. Somebody sends you a, a normal message to you or, um, and it, it shows up, but then, you know, as the activity goes by and more messages come in, it can just scroll on through, All right? So depending on how much you're saving, you, you could completely miss these messages. The, this idea is you send a message and it go to a particular uh, station and that becomes sort of uh, a, a persistent message that gets stored locally on them until they, and they have an inbox. So this, so it allows for direct messaging with storage and retrieval at intermediate stations. So you start off by typing MSG and your message and then you just give the message and that, does it also includes the automatic checksums, um, and so this will send a message to somebody. There will be an indicator you the little that you have a message. You can then uh, within the program open up your little message box, which shows your messages, and will keep those messages for as long as you want. It that stays persistent in actual real storage on disk. Um, so here's the example, uh, KN4 FCC message, right? So this is sending a message directly to Todd. So he doesn't actually have to be at his station, but he would have to have his station on running JS8, uh, be able to hear me, uh, uh, and on, well, which includes being in the same band. So there's also a, a feature though, you can send a message to someone who's not on. Uh, you could message to a call sign and send a message. So for example, I could say, you know, I could send a message to, uh, to KK4SIH that says message to uh, KN4FCC and then the message. And so I would be sending the message to Don who would store it locally on his server until it's retrieved by Todd. And how would Todd know? Well, uh, you could, uh, you query for messages. So you, you just ask query messages and 
you know, you will get uh, query the destination for messages stored for your call sign. And then you would, uh, if, if they have a message for you, they'll reply with a message number. And then you just say query message and give it the ID. And that will deliver the message to you. So here's an example. Typically, and this is what a lot of people are doing now. They just, when they just start up the program, you know, they'll do their heart beating, um, which I'll go over a little bit more, but they'll also just to all call, just type query messages. Whoever's listening, do you have a message for me? And if a station responds, then you, you ask that station to query the message with the ID they sent you and you can get that message. Okay. So JSK call as a network. So I, I already mentioned, you know, the you can see who you can hear. And I mentioned it's also nice to know if people can, can you know, if they can hear you. Not only can, do you hear them. So can you hear me? This mechanism that's built in, this is part of what's called the heartbeat transmission. So it's an automatic, there's a it's an automatic mechanism for transmitting that you can define an interval, a heartbeat. So this heartbeat gets used, just transmitted out and then stations can reply back, giving you a, your, basically your signal report. And so this is something that uh, most users will leave enabled. They wanna participate part of the heartbeat network. So they'll have it, it, it they'll enable heartbeat networking. Um, and then when you do that, you get a little heartbeat button that appears. So when you click on that, you could send a heartbeat request. And so for example, you can see here's a heartbeat request that, that uh, in red that I transmitted KN4TRT at HB. So it's at the heartbeat network. Uh, and that's those who have enabled heartbeating, um, heartbeat and EM60. So that's when I was in Fort Walton. So, and you can see the replies that, I, that were to my station. So the heartbeat reply and the signal reports, it shows up directly to, to me, but also you can see the highlighting in, in red in the band activity. Now, if you have also selected the acknowledge, all right, this is, you have auto reply turned on, you have that enabled and you selected to acknowledge uh, stations. Then when somebody requests a heartbeat, then your station will, will respond and send out a heartbeat. Let, let me see. Okay. My mouse is a little sensitive. Okay, so this network allows you to really plan for the planning of relays, sending messages to be stored and, you know, at, at receiving stations. So you can really look to see, you know, who's out there, how you're seeing them, or even whether you decide, well, hey, uh, I'm looking at somebody, I'm seeing these signals, you know, their signal reports that I'm hearing them are, are pretty good. I could use turbo mode for all of them. And then I come over here and I can see, oh, well, wait a minute, there's a station, you know, that has a, you know, the lowest signal report of what they're hearing me. Um, so you can tune what mode you want to use or, or stuff that way. Or, you know, who you can contact and ask who they are in contact with to, uh, to generate uh, a relay or to have messages stored. Um, you'll notice that in if you're using JSA call that there's more and more people that are leaving their rigs on, similar to like a rig that's running and waiting to listen for, um, you know, like wind link connections or something. And that so you can, they're very reliable for getting uh, back hot beat reports or even utilizing them for sending information uh, and um, uh, or storing messages. So this becoming this network, uh, you know, foundation uh, with JS8 uh, call users. So auto and spot, uh, call sign spotting, right? So when you enable spotting, right, you will, your program will then, right, well, JSA call will report call signs that you hear. Uh, and other people, if they have spotting enabled, if they hear your call sign, then the other stations will report it and they report it to PKS reporter under the JS8 mode. 
So the early on, uh, I showed uh, sort of my signal uh, reports, and that was that's built right into. So you you have the option of of turning on spotting. That's a button right on there. You can turn it on, and you'll be able if you have a network activity, then stations you here. You can uh, send that information off. Oh, not again. Okay. To the to the PKS uh, reporting. Automatic replies. Uh, these are quite nice features so that you can actually send a message to a station and it will automatically be replied. Similar to like, you know, the heartbeat can be automatically replied, but you can send a message like to a station info. And, and just, and you can see in this, in this box here, um, you see it says type your outgoing directed message to N2NR. So that indicates that I, I selected their call sign from the call activity. Once I selected it and highlighted, then, then there, so any message I type in here would go directly to them. And if I just type in info question mark, then you can see my transmission in red from me, from KN4TRT to uh, N to NR info question mark. And if they have automatic replies enabled, then you'll get the message back, info. And here's the info from that station, uh, you know, from uh, N2NR to KN4TRT info, flex radio, vertical antenna, Cottonwood Heights, uh, Utah, end of message. So you sent, this is your, you have uh, a little info button and an info dialog box in the settings that you can put this information in and that can be provided. There are other useful as I have, you can have signal reports, Right, an SNR. You can ask a station for the to automatically send you an SNR. Uh, you can uh, ask a station its grid. It will send you a grid, as I already mentioned. Info their status. You include in there one of the uh, macro variables by sort of my stat, which will tell you how my idle. Okay, uh, you know, and you can word that into your status. Uh, I'm away for so many seconds, or. Um, another very useful is the again question mark. So sometimes there's you get a message and it maybe missed part of the words in there, and you you know, you, and then rather saying uh, you know replying back and saying, well, I heard everything up until here. Can you send this again? All you do is you just type AGN question mark, hit enter, and you are asking that station to automatically resend that last message. I find that tremendously useful. So here's a sort of a mock JS8 called Digital Net, sort of modeled after our Sunday Florida Digital PKS31 nets, right? And so this is, but it's allowed for multicasting in, in the net. So you can sort of see, right? I start off in the beginning, okay, to the group, NFL Digi. Um, all right, so it goes out to the call group. Okay, so this is KN4TRT located in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, you know, my name is Paul. Um, all right, additional information, you know, this is an open net. So all of that would be in a saved message. I wouldn't be typing it in, uh, just send that out. And then right at the end, uh, I will now request a call sign SNR for each check-in. So the check-in would just be, I would send out at NFL Digi, the SNR question mark. And everyone who is on the pass band that's a, that's a, a member of the at NFL Digi group will automatically reply back with their signal report. So you know, oh, okay, here are all the check-ins. Okay, and then you can continue. Okay, I will now ask individual stations to provide updates, right? Okay. Uh, so to the group, uh, then I can say KK4, SIH, Dawn, how are you doing today? And get the reply from Dawn. Um, or, you know, I could, right, send a message out and just say, how is everybody doing? And everybody at the same time can start typing their message in and, and sending it out. And we would all receive these messages that pop up from this person. That, so you can just sort of see that. Um, so that's one way. It would... Make uh, it would shorten the time for a net. Um, I, not something I would advocate. I like the idea of having the check-ins done, um, but uh, it's a possibility. You can see that that flexibility. 
Um, okay, and then you know I, I go into just saying okay uh, to the to the call group. Are there any late check-ins? Please reply with your SNR so they re re give a signal report. Um, uh, and then you know you know sort of the closing out of the net. And you can see once you have your call group your call group selected, you're just typing in. You know the text hearing nothing I thank all participants and close the net and that gets a message gets transmitted coming from you to the group and then all the everyone in the call group would get that message directed right into their into their receive activity so okay additional features JS8 messaging to APRS system so there's a experimental feature the at APRSIS group right that allows you for sending APRS messages to be spotted uh, to the APRS, what, Internet System Gateway, the IS Gateway. So there are generally two message commands available, grid and command. So you can see at APRS grid, and you give your, your grid square. And that will send, you know, it will spot your call sign and grid location to the APRS network. Then you can go look at, you know, through an APRS client, go to the website, APRS.FI, and you will see your location at that grid square. Um, you can also, in JS8 call, send emails, right? Not with fancy attachments, but a simple text email or text messages to phone, to, to people's phones. So here's an example right here at APRS CMD, and then you send uh, the command uh, SMS GTE for sending a text message um, at the phone number you want to send it to, and then what the text. Wind died, running late, so don't worry. Uh, SV Johanna Rose. So uh, <clears throat> you might have noticed from the very first page I started off with, I showed you the picture of JS8 call. That's, I, that's from my boat. And uh, so at times I view this, if I'm offshore, right? And, uh, you know, and, I, and I've been, you know, hundred miles offshore and there's no cell phone signal out there, but I could send a message. Uh, if somebody can receive my, uh, you know, can receive my JS8 call message. Uh, I can send an email. So APRS command email dash two, uh, query at sale docs uh, at me, uh, and then the command GFS. So this is a command for sale docs to send me weather grid files. So I can go see what the winds are gonna be like, uh, you know, for three days. Uh, and uh, well, the one indication, one thing I wanna mention, all right, so uh, to note the routing information between the double colons, so you'll see it here, there are extra spaces that are padded in. And that's because it must be exactly nine characters between there. So that has to, and if you don't put the, if it's not exactly nine characters, then there is a, a, a problem of spotting this to the APRS network. So I find that very useful. Um, but one of, the, one of the nice features is that JS8 call has an API, a programming or application programming interface. And it allows people to communicate with your program and extend it. Um, by just using this, it's sort of like you connect to your program through a what's called a port. Um, and then you can either just type commands or you can either read information. Um, and, and so there are utilities that are coming out. Wow, one person wrote a uh, real time ADIF uploader for JS8 call. Um, this is another one right in the center. This is called JS8 call util utilities. Um, this is a wonderful little utility. It's written in Python, right? Um, one, it's written in Python, so it will run on any computer. You don't have to worry. You don't compile it because Python is an interpreted language, right? Uh, so, and what's nice about that is, you know, you can look at the raw scripting for that and see, well, how do they, if you want to learn how do they create a, a, a graphic window that pops up with buttons and and Python, you can do it there, or you can learn how do they interface with the JS8 call API. And it's really simple. I looked through and just to see the, the simple commands and it's just listening to a port and writing to a port 
and they're able to provide additional functionality. So this particular utility program, you, you see, um, if you have a GPS connected uh, to your computer, well, you can click Get Grid from GPS, and it will create this Get Grid. This is, I, and I use this all the time because I leave my grid to be the grid location of my boat, which is an EM60 grid square. Um, but when I'm going to run it here, I, I run it. And if I'm in Tallahassee at my kitchen table, I click this button and it will get the grid squared for the current location uh, that uh, my radio is at. Um, you can then, you can then send that grid to JSA call, or you could just push a button and have JS, you know, send it to JSA call and then have it transmit. So this is quite useful that way. What, one other feature I like is there's an, uh, another pull down menu here, which you can see I have selected auto TX grid to APR SIS. And then you can enable it to update every, I currently have it set up now at 15 minutes, but originally at every 10 minutes. So at every 10 minutes, it would go and get my location and send it off to the APRS. Uh, and I did this while I'm out on my sailboat sailing through the Chakwahachi Bay. And I could see the grid locations, you know, of where I was fall. It's so tracking me along, very similar to what you see on the APRS FI website of, of people driving through the city. It's just a nice way of sort of my breadcrumbs and it's done automatically for me. Um, and then in here, uh, there's also the ability, if you want to send a text message or an email, the bottom half, you can just choose, put in a phone number and type a message. So it just makes it a little bit easier. You don't have to worry about creating the correct padding. Um, but it's really a nice feature and lots of goodies coming out. So when I started putting this together, you know, sort of a discussion of this, I, you know, I'm looking at Google News. So this sort of dates, you know, sort of tells you when I was starting to work on this. All right, here's the news of the day, you know, about the Supreme Court nominee uh, vote. Uh, and, but I noticed this article below, and right, tracking the grocery supply chain off, off grid with ham radio and JS8 call. So this was a, a group of people who, who were using JS8 call and call groups. They had, they created their own special call group. Um, and they, they were utilizing the auto reply feature. So basically they defined their info, their station info, and they included a, 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 a word in there that was food underscore A-V-A-L equals, and then it was green, yellow, or red. And so people would be going off and try, you know, and contacting everyone in the group and asking them for info. And many groups are transmitting what they had locally. You know, oh, we have no food, it's red. Uh, we got some yellow or there's no problem here, green. And, and these people were then taken and constructing maps, fill, basically filling in grid squares on maps that based on the color they received. So they were doing that sort of by hand and creating these and making these uh, maps available but I could easily see this being extended, something like this being extended using the API feature to automatically, you know, send out the requests to the call groups, you know, the special call group and receiving the information and, and creating these, these color coded maps automatically. So I just thought that was quite interesting. Okay, so other additional resources, uh, you know, a lot of documentation, uh, JSA call from the call website. There's a nice little getting started. Uh, uh, and then there's the help, which basically uh, provides you to the doc, to a nice little manual, which you, if you read through it, you'll see a lot of the information that I presented today actually came directly from, from that manual. There's also, a, uh, you know, a good, more and more YouTube video tutorials that are coming out. Uh, just Google uh, JS8 Call the Basics by KM4ACK uh, does a nice job of introducing JS8 Call and particularly with regards to uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, there's a sneak peek uh, which of JS8 Call with new features by uh, the creator, Jordan. Um, 
Uh, also, there are other APRS off-grid with JSA call introductions by uh, some. So these are some selected uh, videos that if you're interested in just Google, you know, the, the titles and you, they'll come right up. They're uh, quite useful. So, okay, so now let's attempt to try to go, do a quick live. Uh, so I have to admit, uh, I hope this will work because I'm actually, uh, I'm at work. And, and so, um, <clears throat> so, and my radio is actually, there's a picture of my radio on my kitchen table. Normally I keep my radio on my sailboat and that's the pictures in the lower bottom. So you can see this and I, I have the, the head removed from the base of the radio. So the lower left picture, this is the entrance way or the exit way, depending on, and you'll see the radio control head, uh, but you see the microphone going off to a dark area, which I show you is my radio. I have a, this is a USB sound card, the signal link connected to a Raspberry Pi. So that's my standard rig uh, on my sailboat. Uh, I've mounted it, you can see, with these little thumb screws because I'm not always in Fort Walton Beach. I'm, I find myself, after I installed it, I found myself at home wishing I had my radio. Uh, so rather than buying another radio, I just brought that home. And, and so this is sort of my home station, right? And you can see, um, I haven't really invested a lot in this yet. Uh, you know, I paid $510, which I thought was a spectacular deal for a Yaitsu FT. Uh, 891. Um, when I had it at home, I was, um, you know, on the boat, I have a nice 12 volt system. Um, I needed a power supply. I found that I had this old computer power supply, right? It provided 12 volts. This particular one had dual 12 volt rails. Each one was 21 amps. So it provided, so this is 12 volts provide 42 amps of power. Um, uh, so I just actually connect that as my power supply. Uh, I built a, an antenna for about $40. Uh, this is an end-fed um, half-wavelength antenna. So you can see it connected outside uh, with a 61-foot wire going up into the trees. Um, that just comes directly in with no antenna tuner. Uh, I'm really impressed with how well this, you know, I can get access to many bands with just that very uh, simple uh, antenna here. But most of the time, you know, our, the message is I'm running this system with my Raspberry Pi, but it doesn't matter where my radio is, whether it's hidden on the boat, this lower bottom picture sort of shows how I'm operating and sort of how I'm gonna be operating right now. Here's my laptop, it's an Apple, it's a MacBook. It's connected to the Raspberry Pi and I'm running the programs right there, sitting up, whether I wanna be out in the sun and, or underneath the canopy or on my settee with my feet up, I'm not connected you know, directly to the radio. I can enjoy that. The, one of the beautiful things about digital modes and, and use of the, uh, uh, the Raspberry Pi. Okay, so I'm gonna shift. So that's the end of that. And let's move to, okay, so I'm gonna, all right, so I have to just, so I'm able to log into my Comcast computer. Let me give me one second. So well, I've set up a dynamical um, address so that I can connect uh, uh, to my home from basically from anywhere. And so that's what I have done. And I'm going to run. Uh, so okay, so I run. Okay, so here's my VNC program that, uh, so this is my Raspberry Pi, which is sitting at home, All right? So, um, so here's the JS8 call. So you can see uh, if I select up here, well, let me actually do something first. I'll clear all, okay, so I'm just gonna clear all the activities. But you can click up here and you can choose different bands. Uh, I like to stay on the 40 meters. Um, you can, this is where you have a lot of the buttons for controlling the modes. It was currently in turbo. Let me put it back to 
normal mode. Um, okay, so uh, so now let's so let me just tune just to. Okay, you can see I'm running FL uh, rig. Um, so I'm putting just a little bit more than 40 watts out. Um, one little caveat, uh, I'm not sure if other people noticed this, but if you use FL rig, I find that the uh, SWR is always greater than what the radio is saying. And I, I'm not sure if that's uh, a known issue or just uh, my own issue. Uh, so just if anyone uh, knows anything about that, I'd appreciate that. Okay, so you can see I have heartbeat button down here. So let's request, send a heartbeat request now. So uh, I'll send my heartbeat request. So it's basically queued. Now you can see it's sending it. Uh, in the send button, it's telling the time. That's, uh, you can see power going out through the FL rig. And it's done. Now, what you may have noticed is my receiver offset moved to during transmission to between 500 and 1,000 hertz here. And you're seeing all these signals coming in that are replying. So you can see all the replies I've got so far um, re just responding to my heartbeat, right? Which then populates the call activity. Here are the calls that I can hear. Here are you know, the stations I can hear. Uh, one of them, uh, I'm not sure if they can hear me because they didn't have their auto acknowledge for the heart beating on, which is fine. Um, I, I, half the time I'm not uh, acknowledging other people's heartbeats, partly because uh, when I'm out sailing, I don't want my radio to be just consuming all that my battery power. So there are times when I don't want to participate in the automatic transmission of, of uh, heartbeats back. Okay, so um, the other common thing people you can do is, is select, all right, so I'll select all call. You can see directed. I'll hold and put the right mouse button, send a directed message, and I'll just send the message out saying, does anybody have a message for me? So it's, oh, I guess I got to hit enter too. Okay. So you see now it's getting ready. It's not transmitting at this time. It's still decoding. You'll see the lower, the lower left corner. Now it's transmitting. So I'm transmitting out to every member who can listen to all calls, uh, query messages. And if I receive a, a message back, um, so then I could request for them to send me that message. Um, I can deselect from all call. I can just type someone. There is somebody, uh, W4SEL. Um, he's usually on all the time. And I can just ask him for a signal report. Let's see, I contacted him earlier today. He said he was not going to be at his station, but feel free to send him auto requests. So we just sent what we call weasel uh, to say, hey, give us a signal report. Um, it, or I could have just clicked the CQ button and requested, you know, to for CQ. And now you can see there's some activity. The one caveat I will say is because there's a lot of net uh, heart beating activity that I probably should have paid attention. And sometimes when you're sending a request, if you send a request when somebody else is uh, transmitting, then they're not gonna get your request. And so that can happen quite a bit when uh, if somebody is responding or acknowledging heartbeat. Okay, but all right, let's see, um, well, I can, Let's see if, N, okay, N0GQ. Let's see um, if they have an auto re acknowledgement reply. So we'll ask for their info. So 
I'm transmitting. Oh, and I can see a signal coming. Likely that will be our automatic reply, a response. Okay, so it comes up highlighted for me. So you can sort of see as it's decoding N0GQ to KN4TRT info. Um, okay, IC7300 at, and this is all, and it looks like by his band pass, he's running at normal mode. Uh, we have pretty good signal strength, so we could have bumped this over to turbo mode if we wanted to. And you can see it's providing his information. Uh, ICOM 7300 running at 20 watts and a Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, G5RV at three. I guess that's the antenna. And it's still coming in. At 35 feet. Okay. Okay, Colorado, USA. Okay. Um, okay, so it's that's an example there. Um, other, so as I said, you you can send directed messages, select a call sign, and you can type directly in. Oops, that was. I don't want to. Uh, if I again, if I right click, I can choose and send messages. I have saved messages that I could use, previously saved messages that I that I created. Uh, okay, well, uh, my saved messages. Um, but you could do some of the nice, there's the message hearing asking somebody, maybe let's see if this person has an automatic reply and just asking who are the four most recent stations they heard. You may, you know, trying to get a hold of somebody or find out that they can hear somebody uh, that that uh, is outside of your range. And so that depends on whether the station actually will have the auto set and when I sent the signal, I usually should have, I wasn't paying attention. I usually wait to make sure that there's no activities, particularly a heartbeat request, because if you just get out of sync in that regard, you, you know, somebody sends, hey, give me a heartbeat. And then you say, oh, you, uh, you try to communicate with somebody. They're most likely gonna be sending a heartbeat message back out while you're transmitting. So that's, I think one of the biggest uh, conflicts that, that, I, that I've come across. When you have selected somebody and you're having a QSO with them, the automatic acknowledgement for heartbeat requests gets disabled. So you're not in the middle of your, you know, your, your QSO, you're, you know, you're not getting interrupted. Um, so I think I'm just gonna, uh, so we have, I can just do a, a CQ, um, and just sort of, you know, put a CQ out there. Um, I, I don't really want to go into a full, you know, uh, QSO in the middle of a trans, uh, middle of this presentation, but sort of give everyone a general idea of, of JS8 call. And so I hope I did a reasonably good job of sort of explaining the features and getting some people interested in maybe giving it a try. Um, that's all I have today. Thanks, Paul. Um, we had a couple of questions in the chat, and uh, I'll keep them short because uh, I know uh, we went a little bit over, but uh, one of them was, uh, do you have any background information about why they selected 72 bits, why 72 bits is the, the length? Um, I No, I don't know uh, why it's 72 bits. Um, I, I'm sure that goes back to uh, Joe Taylor's 
you know, development for the, you know, for the FT8 and FT4 on, you know, a certain number of packet, you know, bits to, to transmit. And it's probably uh, a balance between, you know, sending a lot of information, but not, you know, but not suffering from part of that transmission, you know, loss, you know. So it's a balance of, you know, what signal, you know, your, what signals you're trying to reach, right? Because you're, you'll do better sending smaller packets, you'll be more successful. Um, so it's like, I'm sure it's optimizing uh, that, but I don't know the, the details. Okay. Uh, the next question, you know, you had talked about shortening uh, the number of bits by using uh, some of the pre-coded words and that kind of thing. Does it make sense given that you've got those shortcuts to use some of the standard uh, uh, ham radio shortcuts like DE for from and, and that type of thing? Well, um, when you, if you look at my, my box here, I'm going to type in a few things. So you can see you're saying, okay, so I type G and, and let me, yeah, so G, uh oh, right. All right. Okay, so I go, let me get, so G O O and D, right? So uh, that's the word good. And so you could ask the question is, you know, do I benefit by typing good? And you'll notice the time is still 15 seconds. You may, you may have to, you know, to see if you're going to benefit, uh, you know, type in two words to fill up that frame. Um, but I find it very useful to, you know, because I've, I've asked the same questions myself to just type it in and, and just see. And you can see that, and it turns out good and good if you, uh, it's it's recognized. It actually some of the ham, you know, some of the ham shorthand has been added into the dictionary, just because you know it's it's our dictionary. It's this isn't a special dictionary. It was to optimize, uh, but you can see, you know, okay, so, uh, well, what did I do? Oh, it's automatic. I have acknowledgement, so you can see I'm. Um, um, automatically transmitting right now a heartbeat back to someone who requested the signal. And so, the, but that's the message. You can start typing in things, C-H-A-N-N-E-L, all right? And you can see that that's, that takes 15 seconds if you look at the send button. But if I, you know, by, uh, well, let's see. I, you know, made a typo. Well, now I got rid of the H, right? It's one less character, uh, but it's now takes twice as long. Twice to as long. Yeah. And, and you get the nice little indication that says, hey, um, this may be what you want, but I just don't recognize this as a, you know, as a dictionary word. Right. Standard word. So. Last question, Paul. Uh, you talked about the different uh, transmission modes, the transmission speeds, uh, and you made it clear that uh, it'll decode no matter what, you have an option to make it decode no matter what transmission speed, but is there any, um, is there any stand, does everybody start out at normal and then go to faster speeds if they can, or how do you, how do you know what's the best speed to use? What generally um, I, I had in one of the earliest slides, sort of the suggestions on what, how low signals, the average signals can be decoded. Um, and, but often what will happen is you know, people will start off in normal mode. I'll start off in normal mode, mostly because the heartbeat networking is is by default, you know, uh, sort of tied to normal mode. If I go up to the to the control and I choose like turbo, okay, you'll see that I no longer have the heart beating. Mm -hmm. So I'm not in turbo mode. I'm not participating in heartbeat there. So so so, but if you start off you know, communicating with somebody and having a conversation and then finding out, hey, you know, um, I'm, I, your signal's great, let's try turbo mode and you just send them something. And, and, and so you can make these adjustments right on, you know, right on the fly. Oh, no, that, I didn't get most of what you said, drop down the fast or, uh, but often I'll, I'll be honest, I, I've spent a lot of time when you know, if I'm having a longer conversation, sort of the rag chews, it's in turbo mode. 
and it's a lot of fun. All right, that gets through our list of questions. And Paul, I want to say thank you very much. I learned a lot, and uh, I'm now uh, going to have to do some exploring myself. I uh, most of my stuff has been with uh, PSK31, but uh, I'm very interested to try some of these new digital modes. So I think uh, you did a great job, and uh, we appreciate everything. Uh, I don't see any new uh, additional questions, so let me just say thank you and uh, good night. Okay. All right.